So why don't we, let's go ahead and get started so we can hand the mic over to Scott Kratz. My name is Suzanne Burns. I serve as the director for the Just Growth Portfolio for the Partnership for Southern Equity, and we are the home for the Just Communities Initiative. Um, I will tell you just a, a few quick words about the Partnership for Southern Equity, and then we are going to hand it over to Scott Kratz, who is with Building Bridges Across the River, and is going to share some really um really fantastic insights as a practitioner um, working on one of the arguably most ambitious equitable development projects in the country right now. Um, so if we can go ahead and advance the slides, I'll get my intro out of the way and hand it over to Scott. The mission of the Partnership for Southern Equity is advancing policies and institutional actions that promote racial equity and shared prosperity for all in the growth of metropolitan Atlanta and the American South. And increasingly, um, as with this webinar series and our Just Communities Initiative, um, working uh, beyond the South in other parts of the U.S. and beyond. Next slide. Our work really is in disrupting systems in silos. And uh, we approach this in a, an intersectional way around several different portfolios. We have staff who work on issues related to equity and energy systems in health and, and uh, social determinants of health, um, health inequities around workforce development and economic inclusion in our Just Opportunity portfolio. Uh, we have an organizing unit who supports community organizing and power building on the ground um, and particularly works on youth power building. Uh, and we have an impact team who do a lot of data analysis, uh, fee for service consulting, um, policy development, that sort of thing. Um, and then again, I'm here in the Just Growth team. We, uh, we also have have developed, uh, been in partnership with other organizations, the Justice 40 Accelerator that is helping to prepare um, community-based organizations to absorb capital from, from federal grant programs that are rolling right now um, through the, uh, the, the federal initiatives that I know you're all familiar with. Um, and Yes for Equity is our youth power building arm. Next slide, please. We were so thrilled to be able to, um, to bring the work of eco districts internal to the Partnership for Southern Equity over the last couple of years through an acquisition um, and have uh, re, uh, rebranded, evolved that work in a way that we feel really is responsive to the needs communities have today at this moment, um, where we are, are certain that the intersections of uh, racial equity work and climate resilience work and environmental justice at the community scale really need to be elevated and supported. Um, so we started this uh, this process and rollout of uh, the Just Communities Protocol launched this year, and and really the work is grounded in these these new principles that were articulated by a number of our partners and um, practitioners and ad, um, allies and advisors from across the country. Um, so we hope that you will sort of sit with these principles, um, think about how they might apply in your work and go to justcommunities.info to learn more about the initiative and the opportunities to engage as an accredited practitioner. Um, we will be rolling out our certification um, initiative this June and, um, and hope that you will uh, be a part of the growing community uh, that is advancing equitable development um, in a way that is regenerative and um, preparing for the climate change ahead. Next slide. As I mentioned, the protocol is really a centerpiece of the, the new body of work that is just communities. Um, it is a, an evolution of the Eco Districts Protocol 1.3. Um, so you will you will find some elements of this that may feel familiar and some that are that are new. And we hope that uh, this is something that can be a framework and a, a tool that is supportive for all of you in your work in projects that we know have impact on communities, in many cases, communities that have been harmed in the past and burdened by uh, poor, poor projects, poor infrastructure, lack of investment. And um, we want to see that this tool can help you to um, to approach projects in a different way that leaves, uh, it includes more in the process and, and has more equitable outcomes. Next slide. All right. 
So enough from me. Let me uh, tee up Scott's conversation today, give you a little bit of sense about him. Um, a, again, the, the project, I imagine, doesn't need much introduction that I'm assuming most of you have, have heard about the 11th Street Bridge work um, and maybe have heard presentations at conferences over the last few years. They have been at this work for a while um, and, and just uh, super excited that we have a chance to hear about it firsthand. Um, Scott has been with building bridges across the river for more than 10 years, um, working with DC city government as well. And, and this, I won't steal much thunder on the project itself. He'll, I'll let him tell you about it. But, um, but Scott has, has been in this space for a long time, um, has a long history in education um, and working on projects that, that involve engagement in the arts and community building. Um, and he lives a few blocks away from the Bridge Park site in Capitol Hill in D.C. Um, he's been there for almost 20 years, um, has a history degree from Pomona College in Southern California, um, and uh, moved to D.C. to become the VP for Education at the National Building Museum. Uh, is also honored to serve on the board of the Anacostia Coordinating Council and the Anacostia Business Improvement District. And with that, I will hand the mic over to Scott and uh, look forward to your Q and A, uh, and and we'll come back and have some questions uh, after he shares a bit with us. So thank you for being with us, Scott. Thank you so much, and <clears throat> thank you to everybody um, who's spending the next hour with us. Um, so uh, what I thought we'd do today, given um, the the um, topic in hand and um, the um, organizer for today, um, the um, I thought I'd give a quick overview of the 11th Street Bridge Park um, the, with a particular focus around our community engagement strategies, um, share some of our latest renderings and where we are with the park, but really spend the bulk of, of the presentation talking about our investments, not only in the bricks and mortar of this new civic space, the 11th Street Bridge Park, um, but the investments that we're making in the community and the residents um, in the neighborhoods to make sure that local residents, the tens of thousands of local residents who've helped shape this park can be the ones that benefit from it. Um, and I'm going to make sure we save enough time for questions. So, but if there are questions along the way, I encourage you to throw questions in the chat, um, the, um, but we'll also save enough time for Q&A. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. There we go. Can everyone see this? Um, and, yep can see him. Okay. From the beginning, there we go. Um, so first, just a little level set. Um, the, the 11th Street Bridge Park is a project of our, um, it's a public-private partnership with the District of Columbia um, and our nonprofit uh, called Building Bridges Across the River. Um, when the founders created that nonprofit um, nearly 20 years ago, they meant that metaphorically, but now we're literally building a bridge across the river. Um, we run <clears throat> the ARC um, it's one of the largest co-location of nonprofit um, organizations in the country, uh, 14 nonprofits that are all co-located on a single campus. We run the Skyland Workforce Center um, the, in a neighborhood that, that east of the, of the Anacostia River here in the nation's capital that has one of the highest unemployment rates um, in the city. Um, we run a network of seven urban farms for a neighborhood that has one grocery store serving 75,000 residents. Um, so addressing food justice. But the largest project that we've taken on to date has been the 11th Street Bridge Park. Um, but before I, I dive into the Bridge Park, um, I, I've been reading um, this wonderful new book by Megan Kimball called City Limits, Infrastructure, Inequality, and the Future of America's Highway. And I've been thinking a lot about sort of our investments that we that we made in the past, um, the um, particularly infrastructure investments and the uh, intended and often unintended consequences that said infrastructure has had on communities. Um, you know, we, we think about, um, we didn't, we as Americans didn't necessarily invent the highway. I think that was the Germans, but um, the, we did invent the cloverleaf, right? These sort of interchanges and, and, and you think about, <clears throat> you know, you see an image like this and I'm sure this is beautiful for a traffic engineer um, there is a sort of wonderful simplicity to it, but we know that the reality of these spaces looks much more like this, right? This is the Southeast Freeway. Um, I, I love this image because those um, poor, the the <laughs> young men that are trying to cross that like just um, gridlock of traffic, which is often um, the, the Southeast Freeway, 
um, you know, it, it's such an inhospitable path from point A to point B. Um, and and not only do, does this um, the do these freeways produce um, the significant amount of pollution, of course, um, the um, causing high rates of asthma, um, the they disconnected communities, um, the for generations, but in their origins, they also often, and this is certainly the case here in Washington, D.C., blasted through neighborhoods. Um, 23,500 residents were displaced for the construction of the Southeast Freeway um, through a pretty narrow section of land on the here in the nation's capital. Um, the 63% of those residents were Black, right? This, this, these were thriving African American neighborhoods um, the, that were um, in a very short period completely displaced. Um, the, this is a picture of the construction um, the, of the Southeast Freeway on its way to the 11th Street Bridge. Just to frame a reference, that's where I live now, uh, <laughs> well, like just a few blocks away from where the Southeast Freeway um, cuts over. Um, and we've built freeways that have divided not only neighborhoods, but cities, communities. Um, the here in Washington, D.C., this is a picture of the Anacostia River, not too if you can see off in the distance, the Washington Monument to give you sort of a frame of reference. Um, but these freeways have not only divided communities, but they've also divided us um, the, from access to nature spaces um, the, that we've learned certainly in the pandemic, it's absolutely critical um, the, for public health, as well as the opportunity to bring together people who otherwise wouldn't normally connect. And <clears throat> this has a significant long-term legacy, not only the lost intergenerational wealth for all of those thousands of homes that, that were bulldozed um, the, to make way for these freeways, but you can see the, um, the delta between one side of the river and the other that's separated not only by the Anacostia River, but the two freeways, the now 695 and the 295 freeway, has seen significant disparities of wealth, significant disparities in investment. Um, there's nearly a $500,000 delta between homes on one side of the river and the other, separated by 900 feet of water, right? I mean, that's sort of bonkers. Um, the uh, nearly 50% child poverty rate on the east side of the river compared to only 6 7% on the west of the river. So these some of this is the natural barrier of the river, but much of this divide and its long-term economic consequences um, the, are the man-made decisions that we made 60, 70, 80 years ago. And that's one of the key issues that we're trying to solve with the 11th Street Bridge Park. <clears throat> so this, the, where the bridges are have been a crossing point for generations in the city. This is a um, picture of the Southeast DC. You can see the RFK Stadium sort of off to the right. And for those that know DC, National Stadium off to the left. Um, and we had this unique once in a lifetime opportunity in the um, about 15, 20 years ago when the old freeway bridges reached the end of their lifespan and needed to be replaced. Um, instead of getting rid of all the old infrastructure, we looked at this as an opportunity to extend the life of that initial federal investment um, the, and transform a vehicular route into a place for people and a place for culture and a place for public health and a place to re-engage residents with the river with environmental goals. From a structural standpoint, um, the I'm not an engineer, as was mentioned, I'm an educator and no idea that I... Um, be building a bridge, but um, yeah, but I've learned a lot about engineering over the last 10, 12 years. Um, and what I've learned is, you know, we, we tried to see if we could save the entire old span, the old bridge, and that's the picture that you see in front of you. But it turned out the deck, that green sort of steel structure on top would have been cost prohibitive to save. So the deck has been removed. But what I also learned is one of the most expensive parts about building any um, particularly river bridge isn't the deck that you drive or, or walk on, um, the, but the piers and pilings that hold all the load. The piers and pilings are in good shape, so they were able to save those. And then what we're in the process of doing, breaking ground later this year, is building a new deck that's on top, well, one that no longer holds tractor trailers or vehicles, but that will hold community-generated programming spaces. And by saving that old federal infrastructure, it saves tens of millions of dollars and greatly simplifies the environmental review um, the, because we don't have to build big sort of caissons in the river. 
the four key goals for the project that have been standing up this from the beginning um, are re-engaging residents with the Anacostia, um, the this amazing natural resource that once was one of America's most polluted rivers, but it's making a really stellar comeback um, thanks to the work of, of activists up and down the river. The communities along the Anacostia River have some of the most challenging health statistics in the city, in the country actually, 41.9% adult obesity rate, lowest rates of um, the uh, access to fresh food um, and groceries. As I mentioned, only one grocery store serving 75,000 residents compared to 10 full service grocery stores just on the other side of the river. So one to 10 ratio. And we know having an access to a safe place to play um, the as well as um, the green spaces can be significant stress reducers and increase public health. The goal that I started this with um, the that I think most viscerally connects with local residents here in DC is, is that physical and metaphorical bridging of communities, reconnecting communities. And finally, and I'll talk about this at the end of the presentation, making sure that this park isn't just an anchor for economic development, but an anchor for equitable and inclusive growth. So when we started this, uh, and I've been the project, you know, leading the project from the beginning, um, we, you know, sometimes these projects, infrastructure projects, um, the first engagement with the community is when there's renderings already designed. And at that point, you know, some of the renderings, yeah, the project itself are 80, 85%, you know, already complete. Um, the And um, particularly for a community east of the river that is has an enormous and justifiable trust deficit, um, the people um, <laughs> that look like me have probably come in this community again and again and made a variety of promises that for a number of reasons have not um, come to fruition. It was really important to take several steps back and 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 ask, in essence, for permission. Is this even something that the community wanted? And we had over 200 meetings those first two years with faith leaders, with um, community groups, with um, civic associations, um, and <clears throat> the it was critical during this work um, the to make sure that we weren't just doing community outreach, but we were doing true true community engagement. Um, meaning, you know, I think um, engagement means it's um, the um, there's there's much more deep listening, right? Um, the in, uh, the outreach is sort of unidirectional. Engagement is multidirectional. So as much as we could, we connected to existing meetings. Nobody wants one more meeting to go to. So connected with um, civic associations, the Anacostia Coordinating Council, the Ward Faith, Faith Council meeting, where people are already used to showing up. Um, providing, of course, child care, um, refreshments, and food. If we were asking people to come in on a Wednesday night, like let's make sure that we're feeding them dinner. We did not do this at the beginning, but this is regular um, work for us now. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd never um, ask a consultant to come down to, from New York to work for free, but oftentimes that's what we ask of the community all the time. So if we're asking the community to spend a significant amount of time and and share their 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 lived and learned experience with us, we need to compensate them. So pay them. Um, and finally, make sure that I mean this community, like many communities, have been planned to death. So how do we make sure that we're we're providing true examples of um, the and um, manifestation of the ideas that the community share? So show these results. We collected all these ideas from local residents. Um, the um, We held big design charrettes on either side of the river. These were the programming ideas that the community um, requested that all aligned with those four key goals that I mentioned before. Um, and then we launched an international design competition in the spring of 2014. And I'd never run a design competition before, but you know when I looked at similar design competitions, um, many designers, the architects and landscape architects had no connection to the client, us, during this process, more or less the community. And, and, and that didn't make any sense to us. So we set up a group that we called our design oversight committee, comprised of about three dozen stakeholders from either side of the river. And their job was to review our design competition brief. These were our rules of how we were going to run the, the competition, make some pretty significant edits, 
meet with our four final design teams again and again during an iterative process of, of the, um, the designing what the park should look like. And at the end of this eight month design competition, it was the community that selected the design team. So I didn't get to vote, the community voted. Um, much of our work, I don't know if I would, would have described it then this way, but it certainly is today of how do we put this decision-making power back into the hands of local residents? And the design that the community selected um, was truly an inspired one. Um, you know, we had 81 firms from across the country um, participate in the design competition. And the design that was selected by local residents was this design by the architecture firm of OMA and the landscape architecture firm of Olin. And it's this sort of double-decked park reusing the old piers from the original freeway bridge uh, that makes way for in a very elegant um, the and um, uh, wonderful way um, programming spaces that the community requested. So I'm going to take you on a quick walk over the bridge from the Navy Yard side to the Anacostia side from west to east. Um, we're capturing all the stormwater on the park. 100% of the stormwater will go into giant cisterns that will be used for um, irrigation. The entire park should be a model for environmental sustainability. The trusses get you up high enough for these really amazing views of the federal city. We're a river city, so it's a fairly flat one. So you get these really sort of long vistas down the river and over into the Anacostia Hills. A center gathering place that we call Anaquash Plaza, named after the original Native American inhabitants who made this their home for thousands of years, the Nokokchenk. This is a space of both passive and active recreation, farmers markets, art fairs, gatherings, small concerts. A hammock grove, a place not only of physical well being, but mental relaxation. We just commissioned three amazing local women artists who are um, designing the hammock grove. Each hammock will be inspired and celebrating a local leader um, the, um, in the Anacostia community. A cafe, community meeting space, <clears throat> a uh, area just outside the cafe called our community front porch, another sort of programming space. The, the designers had, did a really wonderful job at OMA and Olin of creating these small, medium, and large gathering spaces. Um, the um, the so for you know book sale, art sale, what have you. A green roof on top of the cafe and community meeting space. Of both the buildings will be LEED Gold certified. And then perhaps my favorite place on the park, if I'm allowed favorites, is our Muscle Beach play space, um, named after the bivalves that are helping to clean up the Anacostia River. Um, our partners at the Anacostia Watershed Society have installed over 50,000 native mussels in the river to help clean the river, um, pull toxins out of it, and reoxygenate the water column. And then anchoring the east side of the river will be a environmental education center that will tour local school kids, um, inspire that next generation of, of river stewards, climate stewards, access to the river through kayak and canoe launches, paddling up and down the river, uh, urban agriculture, uh, a new farm, a place of um, planting workshops, cooking demonstrations, um, be a place for our farmer's market and CSA. And all told, it's about seven acres from either side of the, uh, uh, including the bridge park itself and, and the land that's adjacent to it. We are now at 100% design. Um, the, the District Department of Transportation, our partners, should solicit our general contractor in the next couple months, break ground by the end of the year, and then open by early 2027. Um, and when the bridge opens, the bridge park opens, it will be owned by the city, but we, our nonprofit building bridges across the river, will run and manage it in perpetuity. But we didn't want to, you know, it's taken us years to go through the permitting or 30 different federal and local agencies that we've had to get approval from. And it was critical that we were testing and piloting programming for the park well in advance of this actual civic space opens. And the largest event that we put on every year for the last 10 years, we just had this earlier this month, um, is our annual Anacostia River Festival. It brings about 10,000 people on a sunny day down to the banks of the park where we set up a stage just where the amphitheater and stage will be on a 250-person amphitheater um, the, on, when the park opens, kayak and canoe launches, 
oh, dozens of nonprofit partners. We set up a Southeast market, um, the um, giving entrepreneurs um, the and small business owners an, an opportunity to sell their wares. We've started a network of seven urban farms in collaboration with communities of faith and nonprofits um, all over Southeast DC to address that food equity issue. And we harvest all of that food um, for a farmer's market and um, a free food distribution. Um, that's JJ and Carrie on our farm team uh, and JJ holding a mushroom log. We've started growing mushrooms at the farm. We harvested about 100 pounds of shiitake mushrooms last year that are delicious, that are distributed at no cost to the community. But when we were out there in the community um, asking what kind of programming should be on the park, we heard great ideas that we baked into the design competition, but we heard a much deeper need, a need for housing, a need to support small businesses, particularly black owned businesses east of the river in a community that's 92% African-American, um, a, a supporting um, workforce training, arts and culture, elevating local voices, history and culture on the of uh, Washington DC. Um, and, and so, we saw this as an opportunity not only to transform this old freeway into a park and and bridge the two sides of the river, but <clears throat> we know where we know that um, without a level of intentionality, um, big signature projects um, the can be a, uh, a tool for displacement. Um, and the last thing we wanted we we wanted to make sure that. You know, the same residents that shaped every element of the park and selected the design team were the ones that could benefit from this. So right after we announced the design team winner in 2014, uh, we pulled together a larger group um, the, of, of experts, a community development financial institution named LISC, Local Initiative Support Corporation, senior scholars from the Urban Institute, the Washington DC Office of Planning, a local think tank of the DC Fiscal Policy Institute to take a look at who lives and works within a one mile walk shed around the park. And that's the image that you see to your left um, and collect a whole bunch of data about housing prices and um, demographics and um, the what kind of jobs do people have, no percentage of renters versus homeowners, um, and then spend a year talking to local nonprofits and the city and local residents of creating actionable items that we could start implementing well in advance of the park opening up to strengthen the neighborhood to make sure that we can answer two very important questions. Who is this park for and who's gonna benefit, right? First and foremost, it needs to be local residents who've gone through some of the tough times here in Washington DC that so they can be here on the, not just to survive, but really thrive during the good times. So after a year of community engagement um, the, and putting um, the sessions up online uh, or putting draft ideas up online, um, doing a larger asset map of existing nonprofits who are already active in the community, we came up with what we called our equitable development plan. We're now in our third version of our equitable development plan. And I'm not gonna go through all 34 strategies, but I'll mention just a few to give you an idea of um, the kind of work um, that we've been implementing for the last seven years. Um, in our housing strategies, we've stood up a community land trust. So the Douglas Community Land Trust is now a separate nonprofit, a separate 501c3 that has uh, over 260 permanently affordable housing units. We've raised several million dollars for early property acquisition and sent a group of local advisors through training. So now two thirds of the board of the Douglas Community Land Trust are east of the river residents. Again, that's what I mean when we are trying to put this that decision-making power back into the hands of local residents. For the last seven years, we've partnered with another nonprofit, MANA, to uh, launch a monthly east of the river Ward 8 Home Buyers Club that's seen 153 renters become property owners, um, the capturing intergenerational wealth. And now we're offering both cash closing cost assistance as well as advice and counsel and down payment assistance um, for these renters to become homeowners, removing those barriers for generational wealth. If we're spending tens of millions of dollars to build the park, 
we want to make sure that as much of those dollars go back into the local community as possible. But to do that, we need to ensure that local residents have the skill set and capacity to apply for and succeed at these jobs. So we've just graduated our 37th construction training program. Um, and we've seen over 250 East of the River residents be go through the program and be employed in construction jobs. So if the general contractor comes to me this fall and says, well, Scott, we can't find any local residents to hire, uh, we can say, well, here's a list of 253 residents who are employed, like try again and try a little harder. And I think this is a great example of why it's so critical to implement these kind of strategies well in advance of a park um, getting under construction, because sometimes we talk about local hiring when we're about to put shovels in the ground, and not that necessarily that's too late, but you need to lay the groundwork. You need to make these early investments to make sure that local residents can benefit. And we've been tripling down on work on supporting um, Black-owned businesses along the two main commercial corridors where the park lands in historic Anacostia on Martin Luther King Jr. Avenue and Marion Berry Jr. Um, Avenue Southeast. And two projects to mention, <clears throat> we've been partnering with the big um, consulting firm, Booz Allen, to provide a year long one-on-one uh, -on -one pro bono, no cost on the um, uh, technical assistance for 10 black owned businesses along Mary and Barry Jr. Avenue. Um, working on everything from, I mean, these are amazing consultants who are working around the world who are working with these small business owners, helping them create marketing communications plan, evaluating their back of house financial services, um, making sure they're in a better position to apply for city or federal grants. That was so successful last year that we just launched a second cohort with working with eight new business owners and two nonprofits doing similar work. And each of those businesses receives cash stipends to help implement those strategies. Not a ton of money, like between five and eight thousand dollars, but you know enough um, the so that they can start that marketing and communications um, uh, plan or purchase that back of house financial software. We've also launched last year a mobile small business kiosk. So imagine an airstream trailer that will house East of the River Black entrepreneurs when the park opens, capturing the million, expected million visitors a year to the park. But again, we don't want to wait for the park to open. So we kicked off last year um, and commissioned an East of the River design firm to create this, uh, what we call our bridge spot, this mobile small business kiosk that's been traveling around the city. Um, the And each of these housing East of the River entrepreneurs and each of these East of the River entrepreneurs um, the receives pro bono technical assistance from another um, big consulting firm, Accenture, who's providing wraparound technical assistance at no cost. These small businesses keep 100% of all what they make, and there's no charge to them. And in our first draft of our equitable development plan, um, we had those first three categories, but you know we we um, had a it was, there was a big hole on the where we didn't include our arts and culture strategies. We were doing arts and culture investments, but it was really important that we elevated arts and culture to the same level as these economic strategies. So in our second version of the equitable development plan, um, we spent a year working with arts and culture leaders and added in a series of arts and culture strategies that include a number of arts, um, the uh, installations well in advance of the park opening up, as well as programs and events like um, the Anacostia River Festival. Um, we've recently commissioned a number of works of art for the park. This is the largest works of art um, called Anacostia Sunrise Sunset Portal Portals by a mother-daughter duo, uh, Martha Jarvis Jackson and Nagina Surrey Jackson. Um, and all of the art um, the, was um, selected by a local curatorial committee comprised of local residents and stakeholders. So to date, we've invested over $92 million in our equitable development strategies. This is more than it's gonna to cost to actually build the park and we haven't broken ground yet. That comes from a variety of sources, um, foundations, individuals, foundations, um, the, um, uh, our partners at LISC DC have made significant investments um, and, uh, and we're not stopping. We're about to announce a series of new investments in the equitable development plan world. Um, the, this work continues to be iterative uh, um, 
identifying needs in the community to see how do we make sure we can we can do our part to be a convener um, the, and the and um, help create a real thriving community. And this was never the plan, but we're our work now we're advising formally and informally about a dozen similar projects around the country. And this is where it gets really exciting, sort of where you see all these little stars in LA and Dallas and San Francisco and um, the Grand Rapids and Buffalo, um, the where um, we've worked with them to follow our seven step plan to engage a local their local residents to create equitable development strategies, actionable items that that work for these different locales because they should be different because conditions on the ground are different. But that process of engaging the local residents, that's what's replicatable. And now there's all of these equitable development plans based on you know, some of this work here in DC that they are being implemented. And now we're learning on the from um, what our partners are doing from coast to coast. And it's creating this larger sort of feedback loop, which is extraordinarily exciting. Finally, and then I'm gonna open it up to questions because this was a lot on a Wednesday afternoon to um, push out during lunchtime. But um, the uh, as an example of the iterative process of, of the Bridge Park's equitable development work, when the pandemic first hit uh, in March, 2020, we were deeply concerned that the community that we serve was going to be disproportionately impacted by COVID. Um, and unfortunately that came to pass because our residents that we serve are, you know, you can't work from home if you're helping to keep the city moving and running and functioning, um, the delivering mail and working in grocery stores and so forth. So um, we partnered with three other amazing nonprofits, Bread for the City, Martha's Table, and Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative to launch what became the largest privately funded unconditional cash transfer program that's ever been attempted in the United States. So over 650 families east of the river received $5,500 in cash, no strings attached, weekly groceries, monthly dry goods. Um, the um, connected them with navigators to, um, you know, sign up for unemployment or my child needs a laptop or what have you. All of which was evaluated by um, the Urban Institute, um, the um, by senior scholars from the Urban Institute. Um, the and this work has become a, a real model. We, we didn't do everything right. There were Definitely a lot of lessons learned along the way um, the, um, that we're now sharing with similar UBI work across the country. So in conclusion, um, the thinking about some lessons learned around the equitable development work of the bridge park, as I mentioned, we didn't, um, you know, we, we've definitely, this has been an iterative process, um, making sure that these strategies from the very beginning, middle, end, implementation, everything, um, they are centered at the community where it's local residents that are driving this work, um, the and prior suggesting and prioritizing these ideas. I can't emphasize this enough. This the trust deficit that exists um, the is um, uh, completely justifiable and and um, it takes time, right? Um, the trust is about shared experiences over time and keeping to your word. Right. So there's this great quote that we didn't come up with, but that change moves at the speed of trust. And that trust is really fragile on the and it needs to be cared for and nurtured. Um, making sure that um, we identified the network of nonprofits who are already active in this work was critical. We are not doing all of this work ourselves, but often we're bringing resources to our nonprofits on the to implement this work. Um, and then we're connecting work that otherwise might exist in a silo in a larger cross-sector, um, the multi-sector implementation in the equitable development plan. Um, understanding how we've gotten to where we are today, um, the, the deep systemic racism that has led to an 81 times difference between the average household wealth of white families and black families in DC, 81 times, right? It's not just the freeways, it's a history of redlining and um, the racist policy decisions, but um, you know, if we're, we're gonna be mapping a future, we need to know where we've been. And finally, the last couple of things, um, measurement of all of this equitable development work is key. You've heard me mention the Urban Institute several times. They're a 70 year old um, evaluation, a nonprofit here in the nation's capital started by um, President Johnson. Um, and they've been our evaluation partner from the beginning, not only documenting this work, but providing this, you know, really important um, the feedback loop of what are we getting right and what do we need to course correct. 
Um, and finally, our, our latest equitable development plan has um, explicit policy recommendations. Um, the, so not just, I mean, the $92 million that we've invested is phenomenal. It's not enough, but it's, you know, it's um, great. But if we're really, there's over a billion dollars of economic development that's coming into this neighborhood in the next five years. So if we're really looking at unpacking that systemic racism and it's um, the manifestation to where we are today, we need to drive those policy changes. So um, each of our five different areas now has explicit policy recommendations. Um, we hope that you can come back in a few short years uh, and see the park when it's open. Um, I am going to put my um, contact information in the chat um, the, as well as our website where or you can download our equitable development plan, a series of short videos about our equitable development work, um, and uh, see some additional renderings. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and go put my contact information. Um, I'm going to quickly go through some of the questions that, um, and then we can see if there's other sort of hands if that works. Oh, that's great, Scott. Thank you so much. This was just incredibly inspiring. Um, you know, as someone who has followed from a distance for a long time, um, you know, seeing the the work really, really deepen and and show so many amazing results is uh, is just uh, phenomenal. And I'm definitely seeing a few questions come in, um, and we have one raised hand. So I'm glad that we we're able to. Uh, to get to the questions now, um, let's see, Trisha, I, Trisha Allen, I see that you've got a raised hand. Are you able to come off mute to ask your question? I'm not sure if our settings will allow her to do that, but let's um, see, Trisha, if we if we aren't able to let you speak, please, um, hopefully you'll drop your question in the Q&A. So if others have questions and want to go ahead and start dropping them in, I know that there are more questions than six out there, but let's, um, oh, let's see, Trisha may be able to to join us here. And if he, I see Kazim has some questions too in the chat, so I'm happy to answer those. Yeah, yeah. Well, why don't you go ahead and, and um, speak to one of Kazim's questions. I feel like you probably answered at least one or two of them during the course of the the presentation, but um, but if you want to to sort of lift up a couple of elements there that that uh, he had a lot of a lot of uh, curiosity and <laughs> yeah no and again for anybody feel free to shoot me an email my contacts in the chat um the for additional for um there's a lot that you know I, I, we didn't get to but um the certainly um there is a um high correlation of um, the obesity and, and living in it. It's not what I was corrected the other day. It's not a food desert. It's a food swamp. Food exists, but um, the, but it's, you know, from corner stores that are super healthy. Right. So um, having this both access to food on um, the, as well as access, safe to access to safe places to play are key. And actually starting next month in June 1st, every Saturday in June, we're going to have a series piloting a series of health and wellness activities. So um, the, for seniors and families. Um, and, uh, also it said the resident led programming didn't list the employment area, though there's, um, high poverty rate employment certainly came up on the, again and again of, of who's going to, you know, where are these jobs going to come from, who's going to build the park on the, uh, and who's going to work on the park after it's open. And so that was one of many issues that drove us to creating the equitable development plan that has a whole series of strategies around um, workforce training um, the and to address the unemployment um, in the area. All right, let's see. Uh, Kazim also had a couple of things that I, I know probably many are, are wondering about in terms of tracking displacement. Yeah. Um, if you have any, any sense of what that impact has been so far. We tracking displacement um, the has has been really interesting because to uh, we talked we had long conversations with our evaluation team at the Urban Institute um, the who came up with a um, very thorough and very expensive um, the proposal for a longitudinal study over the next ten years to track people on an individual basis um, the and we made the decision then i mean it was in the seven figures um the we made the decision then that it was more important to 
spend the dollars now in the community that needed it. Um, the but that's something we're 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 certainly tracking all of our our individual thirty four individual um, um, strategies that we're implementing and, and the impact, as well as ACS ACS data that comes in on a regular basis, but not to the individual level because it just it's 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 really cost prohibitive for a, you know there's seven people on my team on a sort of small um, nonprofit. Yeah, yeah, complicated stuff to get a handle on for sure. Let's see, Trisha, are you able to speak up? Trisha should be able to unmute. Let's move to the next question. Yeah. I see a comment from Deborah Smith in the the Q and A. So looks like you've got another uh, another fan out there who's seen you speak before, Scott. Um, okay, Christopher Wilson. How many critical infrastructure companies of color are currently running in the nation? We have blueprints for. A uh, 1.8 million square foot carbon neutral economic development center, our latest agro power project created 20 megawatts of power with a commercial greenhouse gas has just come online. Um, I think that's an excellent question. I'm not sure, Scott, if that's something that you have a handle on from your um, all of the procurement processes that you've been um, plugged into. I will say that we um, for the when the, the advertisement for the general contractor um it's the streets in a few short months. Um, we will have both a first source hiring requirement so that we, um, the since there is, dist I should have mentioned this earlier, but the overall construction price tag for the park, um, the about, it's 74 million when you add in design fees, project management fees, construction, you know, other 10% contingency, it's up to about 90, 92 million. Half of that's being funded by the District of Columbia. The other half is being funded by us through federal, competitive federal grants. Um, the foundations, individual corporate corporate giving. Um, and uh, and because there's district money in there, um, the 50% uh, of the hires will be local and there will be a 35% um, the um, certified business enterprises. So um, the businesses of color that are local, um, the that uh, will have to be as part of the project. And what's really key, just like working to make um, the to lead our construction training programs for the last several years, we've been working with several other nonprofits to make sure that small businesses, small construction companies, and some of the subs have the capacity to then um, be part of a larger bid. So, how do we make sure bonding capacity, for instance, not to get too in the weeds, but is a huge issue um, the for small companies to go after these larger bids. So, um, the trying to do everything we can to make sure that people, uh, you know, there's truly a level, play, level playing field and, and the dollars go back into the local community that we serve. Yeah, and I'm curious, you know, I, I know that um, that the particular issue you raised around um, the the size of RFPs and, and the complications around insurance and bonding there for those large projects um, is, is something that pops up again and again in our conversations around around equitable procurement. And just curious if y'all have been successful in maybe carving up some of the pieces of the work so that they are smaller um, RFP opportunities and, and not necessarily all the, the giant project lift. Yeah, I think that, and it will be the city that's doing the um, the uh, both solicitation and evaluation, although we will have a seat at the table because we're bringing half the money to the table. Um, the and the way that they've chosen to do this is that there there will be one sort of bid that goes out, but that has a gazillion subs that are under there. But there is a CBE require not goal but requirement um, the of thirty three percent um, the um, that are local businesses of of um, the led by businesses of color. So um, the um, which is critical because again, if the city is spending this money, it should go to incentivize um, the and support um, the local businesses in the district. So. Absolutely. That's good to know. Uh, I have a question here from Lisa Barron asking if you might have been involved in Buffalo. Uh, she says, Rochester is about to get an urban state park in a very economically challenged neighborhood. Sites being remediated. So there is time to enact some of the things that you have mentioned. 
that on your radar or something you are working on? Not in Rochester, but um, in Buffalo, we've been working um, the with the Riverline project. Um, so the Riverline, which is transforming an old canal, um, the into a um, uh, pathways, um, the um, has following our model has created their own equitable development plan, and and actually several years ago we we went after and we very large $2 million grant to support some of our construction training, not only here in DC, but with four other similar parks around the country. So again, building that capacity early around some of the construction jobs, which are some of the sort of more straightforward implementation of equitable development strategies with similar parks in Buffalo, Grand Rapids, Dallas, and San Francisco, all of which is, is um, being evaluated and studied by the Urban Institute and next early next year, we will um, the release a toolkit um, the in collaboration with the Highline Network, a mm -hmm. coalition of 47 different transformed infrastructure and the park and civic spaces across the country um, the, to share lessons learned um, with the larger field. So stay tuned for that. Awesome, yeah, we're, we're fans of the Highline Network as well. I assume that y'all are very active in that. We are, we're uh, one of the members actually, so yeah. Founding members, all right, great. That makes sense. Um, I see another, we've got an anonymous uh, question here, wondering if you could elaborate more on the construction training program, who was involved, were there trade schools, university, construction companies, um, what topics were covered, are they more labor focused um, compared with management aspect of a, a construction project? Yeah, we so we're fortunate that we have a um, workforce development center as part of our larger nonprofit. So um, we did a larger asset map of, of non the uh, construction training programs around the region, particularly in the communities that we serve. And um, the we decided to focus on the harder to employ residents, um, the so returning citizens and, and older residents, um, the because that was an area that there's a lot there were there were met several successful programs working with sort of young people just out of high school, um, the in their 20s, but not many um, the for sort of older residents and returning citizens. So um, we we also, in doing our research, saw that um, one of the challenges for some of the construction training programs that were five or six weeks, they weren't paid. So it was really hard for people to, you know, give up a job for five or six weeks. So we, we kept it very short. Um, the So it's seven to 10 days. It's OSHA 30 certification. It's flagger training. This is very sort of entry level on um, the advanced first aid CPR but then most importantly, we want to be measuring not who just goes through the construction program, but making sure that um, we're providing the larger wraparound services to um, get people jobs and have them keep jobs in three months, six months, nine months, right? So um, we hold monthly job hiring fairs and and the staff at Skyline Workforce Center um, the, has a really good sense of like, okay, you're, you're ready for this job or, hey, we need to build some additional skills around sort of X, Y, and Z before you go into this interview. Um, and then convene the graduates on a regular basis, and we they hold um, every quarter dinners on the with the graduates to come back, and both share lessons learned with some of the um, current classes, as well as like where are there additional needs that they that they have. We've been successful at receiving some um, private grants to to have uh, some additional resources when a car breaks down or um, the a job changes and and it's not close to metro and so they need some transportation assistance or you know what do or they somebody needs child care that we're able to um to provide some resources to overcome some of those barriers excellent well i think we've got time for maybe one last question rob bennett has has hopped on um and i believe is able to unmute and maybe ask his question hey rob hi scott how are you nice to good. see you good to see you too thank you um, yeah, and it's it's great to see this presentation. Um, Don Edwards, who was a longtime part of our Eco Districts community, and I know you know well, um, you know, really talked a lot about you know, what you were sort of bringing to fruition. And so it's so exciting to see. I wanted to ask is, is perhaps the last question to reflect on, you know, the role of your organization as backbone and some of the lessons learned around governance and decision making, because so much of the work that just communities and eco districts prior you know, really grapples with is that is that long term planning and that organizing that you talked about, but also, you know, how to make difficult decisions, how to get through some of the trust barriers and ultimately, you know, build long term governance and leadership. So can you reflect a bit on on the journey you've been on and, and anything you could uh, share with our community? Yeah, um, 
<laughs> there I'm trying to um, synthesize because I've got like a hundred things I want to say. Um, but I think a couple sort of lessons. One, as um, as we built our um, the organization, like you know, I'm I'm not from DC. I'm some you know white guy who moved to DC. DC is now my home for the last nearly twenty years. But um, as we were building our team, it was really critical to make sure that the community that that our team reflected the community that we serve. Right. So we make sure that at least half of the staff are east of the river residents. Right. And that's critical. Not only um, because it's the right thing to do, but it also means that, like inside our conference room, inside every decision, right, there are um, uh, the, those voices, right, helping to drive those directions. It's also really important that, like, we're thinking about a transition plan. So I'm not going anywhere anytime soon, but like um, the, but after the park opens, like I probably shouldn't be the person who runs it, runs it, right? So um, last year on um, the uh made one of our um I was super happy to promote one of our staff as deputy director um with the explicit goal that she's going to be running a park someday right so spending the couple years to make sure that i'm um connecting her with the relationships that i've made in the city and with funders and its key community leaders right so there can be sort of an easy sort of handoff um Additionally, I think that one of the key uh, le the key findings from our um, unconditional cash transfer program was the unique role that nonprofits play versus city versus the government, right? Um, the in being that sort of boots on the ground and and being a trust expediter, right? Um, the so there's often a lot of trust deficit with cities for a variety of reasons. People change and decisions are made and what have you, but. The nonprofits are, are are closer to the community and 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 aren't going anywhere, right? Um, the that are going to be here for the for um the a longer time and so can make a deeper commitment. And so, having we work very closely with the city, but having a nonprofit like building bridges across the river be the one that's implementing this these strategies and making this long term commitment to the community that we serve. Um, the that sometimes is different difficult with cities that go through different administrations where parties change and you know whatever um the I think is really critical. The last thing I'll say is several years ago we started a, a this wonderfully powerful program called our Community Leadership Empowerment Workshop or Clue that is uh, training for local residents to um, be even more effective leaders. So um, they um, it's thirty uh, hours of training of how to run a meeting, how to de-escalate conflict, how to build consensus, how to understand the urban planning process. Um, the And um, it's we, we end each session um, the where the group gets a $5,000 stipend to create their own project and, and implement some of these um, the tasks and uh, these ideas that they have. Um, and the impact has been phenomenal. We've seen people be elected to office, quit their jobs and start new businesses. It's been really phenomenal. So we just wrote a national curriculum that we're looking to um, looking for partners um, the, to um, sort of help uh, uh, sort of bring this across the country. So hope that answered some of your questions, Rob. Thank you, yes. Awesome, Scott. Well, thank you so, so much for sharing all this wisdom and experience, lots of lessons learned. Um, that we hope folks on the line can take away um, and, of course, have your contact information if they want to uh, to follow up with you directly. And I know that PSE will definitely be in conversation with you directly. We've got a lot of uh, fertile ground to, to, um, to work together. I, I dropped in the chat here for those who maybe didn't notice in the um, in the announcement about the webinar today. Scott had shared several different um uh, advanced reading uh, or watching uh, pieces that I encourage you to take a look back at. Um, particularly, you got to check out this video. It's um, it's really powerful, well done um, piece. So you all have the links now um, and also some updates on their equitable development planning. So check that out for more details. Um, as we leave, you want to make sure that you know that we um, we have heard the interest in a next uh, live AP Foundations course. Um, over the summer. So we are going to be offering that up uh, July 18th and 19th. We'll have the link for you shortly. Um, and we are um, continuing to move towards launch of our asynchronous course. So those who may have a real challenge with carving out um, a couple of days of time to be um, in an interactive Zoom with some peers, um, you'll have a chance to, to be um, 
going through this course and, and getting accredited through uh, an asynchronous sort of on your own time. Um, we've had 100 folks already join us on course um, courses this year. So we're excited to bring uh, more and more of you into that community. Um, we will be offering a, another webinar June 26th will be our next one, same time on a, the last Wednesday of the month. So look out for announcements about that. Um, and again, just uh, thank you. Thank you, Scott, for all of your time and wisdom. We look forward to uh, keeping you in this community moving forward and um, hope everyone has a, a lovely rest of their Wednesday in uh, what I have, have now uh, heard coined as, as the month of mayhem. Um, so we know there are lots of, lots of end of year graduations and activities going on right now. Please be, be safe and, uh, and enjoy the, the family time and, and gatherings and, uh, and great lead up to Memorial Day weekend. So Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see you next month. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.